I want us to go to the book of Acts, please, if you would. And we're talking on the hearing the voice of God. And I want to speak to you this morning about the voice of the Lord and direction concerning your ministry. The next step, next phase. And we could spend a little bit more time and I probably might address some things tonight or even tomorrow night, but we'll finish up tomorrow night anyway. I'll, I'll close out this whole series tomorrow evening, Friday night. And uh, I'm going to have Brother Norval Hayes in the morning share on the will of God and the voice of God in the morning time. Amen? To help those of you. Don't miss the morning session. Some of us, we have some other things to do, but don't, don't, don't you miss the morning session. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Now, if you'll go over to uh, Acts chapter 9, Hallelujah. The call of Saul. The call of Saul, who ended up becoming Paul. Amen. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. And desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogue that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shone round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice. This is the first time he heard that voice. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? Now, he asked the question and answered in the same sentence. So, what does that tell me? When you hear the voice of God, you know who's talking to you. Amen. You might be asking it, but while you're hearing, you think it can only be one person. That has to be the Lord. Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what would thou have me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise. Now listen to this. Arise and go in the city. It shall be told thee what thou must do. You see, now, you say, well, the Lord called him. Yes, he did, but God didn't tell him what to do. God called him. God will call you. God will speak to you, but he's not going to tell you everything. Well, what do you want me to do? He'll give you the next step. Arise and go to the city. Then it will be told you. See, sometimes we sit around waiting for the full plan. Or what people do is they go and they devise the plan and then go to God and say, here's the plan, please bless it. You don't go on with your plan and tell God, please go ahead and bless my plan. This is my plan. I like it. I'll tell you right now, my plan would never be the way I'm going. I never wanted to do mass crusades, ever. I'm serious. I mean, we, we went to Singapore, I remember 95, and the National Co Conference Center to see about 12,000 people. We packed that place three times a day. Well, by the last day, they said, we have to move to the soccer stadium. I said, I don't want to move the soccer stadium. No, we have to. We can't fit the people in. And by the way, we're going to release those DVDs shortly, like 10 years later, you know. But they'll come out, people get to see the meetings. I was a lot younger then, you know. <laughs> Joe Cruz had a ponytail at that time. And he was a lot younger. He's looking real old now. I can say that because he's not here this morning. He's trying to get ready for tomorrow. Ain't going to help him anything. Amen. All those that are not here today trying to get ready for tomorrow, ain't going to help him. We're taking them out. Anyway, that's another story. And those that are here are going to have the anointing to do well tomorrow. Anyway, that's another story. <laughs> but <laughs> so they said, they said, they said, well, we, we've got to move to the soccer stadium. I said, well, can't we just stay here? They said, look, there'll be too many people. So we moved 
to the, to the soccer stadium, and, and 35,000 people showed up that night. And I didn't know really how to respond. I, didn't, I never had a crowd of 35,000 people. I, I didn't know what to do. I thought, my God, because I walk up to the front row. You know, I always interact with people. And so when you're in a massive crowd like that, you think, if I walk up to the front row, I'll be under the grandstand. They won't even be able to see me. So I like to walk up, look at people, see people, you know? I'm not the type of preacher that can just get up there and you could put, you could put corpses and they'd preach and have a great time and have a message and just, I'm not that kind of person. I look out, I read, I can, I can see what's going on in the crowd, you know? I know if people are receiving, I know if they're not receiving. And I, and I work very much off of the hunger of the people. If there's no hunger, I just, I'm not even inspired. I don't, I don't really, nothing is drawn out of me. I don't even feel like, I feel like, well, I, I just think I'll go home. I mean, they don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. Why are we even wasting our time? I'm not going to come and just take a message and gonna, I'm going to just deliver it because I need to deliver a message. No matter if Behelzebub and Jezebel and all of them are sitting there. I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take care of Jezebel. We're going to run her out of town. We're going to get rid of Beelzebub and whoever else, whoever Bubba needs to be taken out. Can you say amen? I'm going to clean the air before we can, we can go further. Amen. Jesus did that. He asked people to leave the room before we had a miracle. So if I get up and I send something wrong in the spirit, I smoke the house. I'll do whatever. I'll bring a set of bagpipes in and run them down the aisle. Don't even, listen, I've done it before. I'll send somebody out with a saxophone in the middle of the crowd and go blow the thing till they can't take anymore, they take off. I say go find all the long faces and go blow that thing. Well, I mean, you, you either respond or you don't. Some say, I'm getting out of here. Good, I want you out. Clean that house. My God, we're trying to have a move of God here. Amen. This is not a concert, it's not a show, it's not even a place for critics to come. Amen. Now other people minister differently. I'm not criticizing the way they minister, but I just, I flow, that's the way I flow. So when I found myself in, the, in that stadium, I thought, okay, what am I gonna do? I'll just give an altar call, because I know, I know what I'm doing with that, you know, by his, let's give an altar call. I gave an altar call. 5,000 people got saved that night. I mean, this, we went from worship straight into altar call. 5,000 people came down and got saved. And um, I wish we had a shot of that. Do we have a shot of that? See if they have a shot of that. One of these days we can get the place when I start talking about, do we have a shot of the sweep of the crowd in Singapore quickly to put up on the screen? No sound, just, just put it on while I'm talking. So you can understand, yeah, I'm standing there, I'm looking at this massive crowd, I'm thinking, how am I even going to communicate with these people? So I had another evangelist with me that night. I said, listen, you preach. <laughs> he said, why? I said, because you've been doing this all the time. I don't know what I'm doing. I said, you, I, said I did the old call, I'm happy, I got the souls. I said, you go ahead and preach. I've got to learn this. I've got to learn how to do this. I just felt much safer in a meeting like this. I thought I'd spend the rest of my life in churches. I don't care. You give me 10 people, I'll have me a meeting. Because I don't even look, I mean, I don't even look at the crowd. I don't worry about the crowd. Some people, if the crowd's big, then they're really on fire. If the crowd's smaller, then they, they, they're like a wet blanket. I, I, have a, I have me a meeting, it don't matter. If there's 120 people, I have me a meeting. I mean, I'm just gonna, I preach like there's 10,000 people there. Amen. And I don't give less. I've watched people walk in. When the crowd's not that good, let's just hurry up and have a meeting and we'll go have lunch. I thought, what? That's why you'll never have anything, you ugly thing. You. And then they get mad with the people that did come because they're people that didn't come. How I many you know what I'm talking about? get mad with the people that did come because all the people that didn't come. Tell me when they get it up, if they do. Now, 
So you can understand. I mean, that's another whole, it's a whole dynamic. Because, first of all, in a mass crusade, you can't get out and lay hands on people. You, they'll kill you. So you have to learn that. Rule number one in mass crusade, don't leave the platform. <laughs> Amen. You'll get killed. Somebody says, well, I need to touch the people. They'll touch you, buddy. And I'm telling you right now. Nobody, once the crowd starts moving, it's over. You, you, can't, you can't stop it. And then people get hurt and whatever. And especially if miracles start happening, don't ever leave the platform. Because as many miracles as you have, there'll be people dying. The Friday night in Umlazi, when 70,000 people packed that stadium, and there was fences around. And I'm standing there and I could see, I thought, Lord, this is, and we're trying to get the people to move by section. We, we said, okay, just each section, just move quietly and wait for the next, but they don't, they flow like a sea. And we had five people crushed that night. Fortunately, none, nobody died, but you know, it can come close. Just one little thing starts a, a stampede. So you have to learn all this dy dynamic. It's a totally different dynamic. And then how do you communicate the gospel, you see? And instead of laying on of hands now, you, you, you're releasing the power of God through the words of your mouth. You can't lay hands on them. It's impossible. Don't even try. I had a pastor friend of mine who went to Africa and he climbed off the platform and he couldn't breathe. He was squashed in, in, the, in the press. He couldn't breathe. They had, the police had to literally pull him out. He said he nearly died because of, this, of the press. Now, the Bible does say, you know, Jesus many times was in that press, but he walked through them. He had that ability, supernatural ability to walk through the crowd. But sometimes the crowd doesn't have that supernatural ability to walk through the crowd. Somebody dies and gets to heaven. What happened to you? I went to one of them crusades and, and, uh, and I got run over. So I never wanted to do that, but, but I learned something that, and, I, and I watched the dynamic of it and I said, well, Lord, that was 95. And then of course, the end of last year, uh, you know, 2000 and what was last year? 2004, we, we had the first one in, in South Africa. And even then, I, uh, I had to learn the flow and uh, I, 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 I kind of struggled a little bit with it. But when we hit Umlazi, it was like we clicked. We found the flow. We found how, what the Lord wanted us to do. And the Lord said to me, he said, I want you to start off with a salvation message, simple salvation gospel message with an altar call. Right after that, then I want you or your wife and I let Adonica do that. She teaches on the baptism of the Holy Spirit for 10 minutes. And then we pray for everybody to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Thousands of people just get baptized, begin to speak with other tongues. And then right off that, I release the joy on the people. And then we go straight into miracles. I don't even talk, teach in healing, whatever. I just say, if you're sick, anybody put your hand on your, on your sick part. And I tell people, if you're listening on the radio now, because remember, millions are listening by radio. So put your hands on your sick part of your body. And then I just start calling, not by even word of knowledge. I mean, you can if you want to, but I just start at the head and go to the toe. I call out every sickness and disease I can think of. And then I say, if you've been healed, now come forward. And the hardest thing we have to do is to try to get the people that have been healed from the crowd to get up here because they can't get through the crowd. So what we do is we get them to come forward. We interview them and we keep them for the next night. And so when, when I say, if you've been healed, come forward, and I start calling people, they were healed the night before because it's gonna take another half an hour to 45 minutes to get the people up to come testify. And I mean, the miracles were, were amazing, astounded me because 
People were being healed in their homes, set free in their homes. So there's a whole new dynamic. Now, the Lord said to him, go in the city, it'll be told you what you must do. Some of you are wanting God to tell you everything. The Lord is not going to tell you everything. God will only tell you the next step. You might see an overview and you might see the future and you might see this is what I feel the Lord's going to want me to do. But you don't know how to get from A to Z. And God's not going to tell you how to get from A to Z. It's A, B, C, D. Amen. I don't know about you. I don't want to go A, B, C, D, A. A, A, B, 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 B. Keep stuttering it. B, 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 B. I want to move on in God. I want to move on in the things of God. And sometimes the Lord is not going to speak to you until you do what he last told you to do. If you, if, you, if you haven't heard his voice and you haven't heard his leadings, go back to the last thing he told you to do. It's like, how many of you remember you, you walk into the house and you were going to tell your wife something and you came in the room and, and you looked at her and you said, and she said, what is it? And you said, oh, it's up there. Just, just run there quickly. Yeah, this is Singapore. Not really the shot I was looking for, but I guess that's Singapore. Come on, pull it back. I should be a cameraman, I'll tell you what. And you must understand, that's like a camera right up close on, on, on the, on, in the stadium. But from where you're on the platform, they just look like little people. Just little, tiny little people. You can't see their faces. You can't see their, eye, their eyes. That was a great shot, gentlemen. Phenomenal shot there. All right, shut it down. Yeah, great. Okay. <laughs> so it's a whole different dynamic. Now the Lord will take you on a journey. God will take you on a journey. And the Lord gives you, remember this, God gives you room to make a few mistakes. God doesn't watch, you, you go along and suddenly you make a mistake and then he hits you over the head, boom. Because sometimes you're only going to learn by, uh, by experience. You're going to learn by trial and error. <laughs> you head in that direction and, 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 and you say, oh my God, th this is not right. I misinterpreted it. I got half of the story. I didn't get the whole story. Or the Lord gives you a word and then you tack on to it. <laughs> Amen. God gives you a word and you say, hey, well, then we can do this and we can do that and do that. And then eventually you've got 20% of what God said, 80% of what you cooked up. And the worst thing you can do is bring a whole group of people around you and then have like a think tank and everybody throwing their opinion and then you find the best story and then you go ahead and do that. Now, go into the city and they be told you what you must do. What you must do. In the ministry, you need people to help you do what you must do. Not what they must do. What you must do. Somebody said, well, they must do something too. Then let, them, let they go and do what they must do. Amen. Just remember this, nobody 
is obligated to help you do what you must do. I got ministers sitting around moaning and gripping because their ministry is not further down the line because they feel somebody should have helped them do what they must do. When I started the ministry, 18 years of age, young man, call of God in my life, the anointing, full, full anointing that fell on me in 79, did in 1980, was made manifest in the ministry, yet I wasn't ready for anything, you know, thought I was, but wasn't. Was ready to take on the world, couldn't even take on the house. <laughs> And so you go through this process of making full proof of, of your ministry. I remember the story that they grabbed the Bible of a 95 year old man, been serving God, preaching for many, many years, and everything was underlined. And it's like the whole Bible was underlined, everything was marked. It wasn't a page, there was nothing that was blank. And everything had the letters TP, 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 TP next door. And, and the man just said, well, what's that TP, TP? He said, tried and proven, tried and proven, tried and proven. <laughs> I guess after 95 years, he had that much time to try and prove everything. <laughs> Amen. So you're going to learn by doing things wrong. We don't recommend it. But the only way to learn is to make some mistake. If you take a little child, put them on a, on a bicycle, they're gonna fall a couple of times. But let, they'll fall a few times and then they'll be okay. And then even adults fall. If you don't believe that, ask how many people ride on a motorcycle have ever come off their motorcycle. Anybody here riding a motorcycle? How many has ever come off that motorcycle? Oh, I rest my case. Should we put a training wheel on it? No, there's, there's, there's decisions to make at the last minute. There's suddenlies that happen. Ministry is full of suddenlies. You're going along and suddenly something you that you didn't expect. Now it's not a surprise to God. God knew it was coming. You didn't know it was coming. What are you going to do? So there's decisions that you have to make on the road, on the run, in the heat of the battle. And sometimes you make the right one. And sometimes you make the wrong one. If you make the wrong one, do what you do. If you, did, if you were driving your, your car and you went off the road, put it in reverse, back up, and then try to get back on course. Amen. I beg for mercy, God, please help me. I'm, I'm the dummy, forgive me. Amen. I've done this so many times, I can't even begin to tell you. That's why if somebody ever called me stupid, I said, look, don't try to do what I've already done to myself. Amen. But I ain't as stupid as I used to be, I'll tell you that right now. And then also, of course, decisions are costly. Some mistakes cost you millions of dollars. They will. But that's okay. The Lord can even help you through that. Amen. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to step out and do what the Lord is telling you to do. Go into the city and it shall be told you what you must do.
And it's all step by step. I remember several years ago, I went into South Africa, went to the township of Tembisa, which will be one of the places we have a mass crusade here in the next year or two. It's not far from Mamalodi right now. It's probably an hour away. And I went to preach for a dear friend of ours, pastors of church there, a couple of thousand people, Pastor Ben and Dorby. And I'd met him years ago. He'd come down to one of my meetings and we were talking and he said to me that he was going to go to a certain township and start a church. And I said, well, is that what the Lord says? You know, I always, I always inquire. I inquire with someone. Is that what the Lord's telling you to do? He said, no, but that, you know, I didn't really know what else to do. I said, that's not the right place. I just, it popped up right in my spirit. I said, that's not the right place. That's the wrong place. You need to go. God's got somewhere else for you to go. So anyway, he doesn't go there where he was planning to go. He goes to another township. The thing takes off. So I go. Now we're in this tent. There's about 2,000 people there that day. And I'm sitting there. I'm, I'm tired. I'm jet lagged. And I hear the Lord say to me, I want you to give this church, this pastor, I want to give this church a million rand. I'm going, I rebuke that, I bind that in the name of Jesus. I take authority over that. You foul devil. I mean, you know, I'm rebuke. Because first of all, it's already costing me to go there. And at six or seven, at that time, I think it was 13 or 14 to one. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, I'm not going to get anything. I mean, it's like a, it's a wash. I mean, not that we do now, even with Mama Lordy, We bring nothing back from there. You pay all expenses of everything. And that's not why I'm going anyway. I, I, I pay to go preach. Yes. Come on. Amen. I pay to go preach. Yep. It's costly to go preach. Yes. And I gladly pay to go do it. I believe in this message. Amen. I'm one of the chief sponsors of this message. Amen. I'm, I've got ways. I'm, I'm busy with many ways of sponsoring this message. Yeah. I, am spo I am sponsoring it like I am going to sponsor it in the days to come. But I plan to pay for each one of these crusades. Amen. I'm working on that. I'm not even talking through an offering. because people don't have enough offering to pay for all the crusades I'm going to do. And I can't wait for them to get taught and get excited about giving. Amen. Thank God for all those that do and all the partners and everybody that gets behind the ministry. But I can't wait for them to suddenly get a vision of souls and the harvest and eternity. I already have that vision of souls and the harvest and eternity. I can't wait for some business people to catch the vision. So I've caught it. If I've been faithful for 25 years with anointing, then the Lord will give me the other side of it. And we'll not only go do it, but we'll fund it and we'll get the job done. Amen. I mean, that's not even negotiable anymore. It's just, it's come to that place. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. What a sweetie. This is Elliot's first day in church. Look at that. Congratulations. I better, I better keep preaching there. He's, he's starting, starting to wake him up there. He's what? He's been watching online. He has. Bless, Bless his heart. Oh, God. Little Elliot was born, what, two weeks ago now? September, September 28th. How many pounds? Uh, eight, just under nine pounds. Just under nine pounds. Isn't the Lord good? That's
that's so great. That is so great. Awesome. I'm sorry for that distraction there for a moment. I, I hadn't seen the baby. I wanted to see the baby. And we're excited about what the Lord's doing for Eric and Jennifer. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Say, say hello, Elliot. Hello. I'll tell you what, when he was born, he came out, he said to the nurse, do you know for sure, for sure, if you died right now, that you... <laughs> Anyway, so I'm sitting on the front row and the Lord says to me, I want you to give this church a million rand. I said, Lord, I don't have a million rand. I don't have a million rand. I mean, if you divide at that time, I think I'm trying to remember what it was um, in ex exact amounts to do, but it would, it would have worked out to, um, I think at that time it was about 10 to 1. So it would have worked out about 10,000 a month that I had to do something like that over the next year. I had to divide it over the next year. So I just felt I'll just make a commitment to do that. I don't have it, but over the next 12 months, I'll just send them that amount. So when we get to the back room, I'm sitting with the pastor and I said, hey, pastor, I said, uh, this land that you're on, he said, yeah, he said, the land's not adequate. He said, we really need to buy our own piece of land. And he said, you know, we really need some help with that. I said, well, how much do you need? I thought he was going to say five, six, seven thousand million rand, you know, for a piece of land. He said, oh, a million rand. I go, oh, brother. So I said, well, the Lord spoke to me on the front row today and said that I should, um, you know, we should do that. And we commit to do that over the next 12 months. And he just looked at me and he said, you don't believe this. He said, but I, we, the church just had a million rand stolen from us by a businessman. And he said, we were going to buy the land. And he said, you coming right here a month after this happened. He said, it's just, you don't know what that means to us. And so over the next 12 months, every month we sent the money and we gave them a million rand for Tembisa, for the land. And they, and they, and they bought, I believe it was, about 30 acres of land to build the church. And so uh, on the way back to the hotel, you see, I, I, you believe this or not, I have the Lord speak to me so many times about giving. And that's not what I'm talking about right now. I mean, we'll take an offering in the end, but I'm, I'm preaching the series right now. Please hold on to your wallets. I mean, in the moment I mention, everybody start getting, just please, take a chill. But I'm telling you, from my point of view, I have the Lord speak to me about giving more than anything else. More than anything else. I have God speak to me, I want you to do this, I want you to give that, I want you, I want you to give that away. Because sometimes that involves your next step. In actual fact, every time it involves your next step. Because one step of obedience opens the door to another level. You want the will of God? Yeah. Well, then do what I tell you. I don't want to do that. Okay. Stew for a while. Then you get desperate. I'll do it. I'll do it. Okay. Go do what I tell you. Okay. I'll do it. Phew. I should have done that a long time ago. What's wrong with me? Somebody hit me. God says, you turn loose of what you got, and I'll give you what I have. Amen. On the way back to the hotel, now this is how the Lord works. What year was that Tembisa? Do you remember what year that was? Two thousand and two, November two thousand two. Now remember, this was still when I was at my tightest, when I was at my my worst condition. I didn't realize, and then right after that, the Lord said, "We'll go home, clear the calendar." You know, we already went through that. Was well, no, that was November two thousand two. We'd already done that, hadn't we? 
Are you, are you sure it was 2002, was it 2001? I think it was 2001 because we paid the whole thing over 2002. Yeah, it was, it was 2001 in the worst time of my life. And then God says, give a million. And then of course, you know, when the Lord said to me, clear the count in 2002, I've told you that story the other night. But on the way back to the hotel, I'm driving down the road, the Lord said, because, listen to what he said, because you were prepared to give a million rand at one time in your home country, I'm gonna give you a million souls at one time Hallelujah. in your home country. Now, that was before I even knew that we were going to do a mass crusade. See, one step of obedience, you see, everybody's looking for the will of God, but they don't want to be obedient as they go along. And sometimes the Lord has to bring you full circle, take you another six, eight, 10, 12 months, and you're back at that same place. And then he says to you, do this. I ain't doing that. I ain't going to do that. Bless God. Okay, fine. How about another 12 months walking around like that? Keep crying, keep begging me, whatever. It's very easy. Just do what I tell you. Just do what I tell you. But Lord, and you can reason in any which way you want to. Listen, we didn't have the minion. We, we, trying to, we trying to do what we do here. I was already sowing by being there. I was already sowing seed and bring our team out and doing there. It was already costing me. Then we were gonna give another million on top of that. But look what he did, because the seed was sown. I heard the word of the Lord say, because you've been prepared to give a million, I'll now give you a million at one time. Then, of course, the end of 2002, when Kelly died, and I held him arms, and I bowed 100 million souls. And then the Lord said, now, believe me, for 10 million souls in South Africa. Well, we're already sitting at 1.1 million decisions already. And I'm told about in the next five years, I'm told until the end of 2010, we set a goal. This is, this is not for the life of, of our life or the ministry, however long Jesus would tarry. This is just for the next five years. Now, somebody said, well, you're on a slow start. Well, next year it'll treble. The following year, it'll treble. The next year, it's going to pick up momentum because of the scope of what we, we're doing. It's, it's not just going to be mass crusades. There's going to be mass media involved. There's going to be film and television. There's, there's, there's many different things that we're doing. I can't tell them all to you right now, things that we're working on, but there's going to be many different methods. We're going to be fishing in a lot of different ponds catching a lot of different fish with every available means, through the printed page, through the internet, through television, through radio, through film, through you name it. If it's out there, if there was advertising space on the moon, you're probably going to see a sign up there that we're going to pay for that'll have a flashing light and you can read it at night that will be promoting the gospel because we have decided we're going to use every available means at our fingertips to proclaim this good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. But you see how the Lord works with, with a seed sown drop. Because you've been prepared to give a million at one time, I won't give you, the day will come, I'll give you a million at one time. Well, I thought that would all happen in Soweto. But if we didn't even have the council, we didn't even have the workers that we could even follow the people. We know that we handed out 177,600 decision booklets. That's all we know. And then we don't know how many were saved by listening on the radio that prayed the prayer. Only heaven has the count. The same thing happened with the Mlazi. We know that we handed out 286,000 decision booklets. And of course, we've been criticized by that, where, you know, where all the decision cards and all that kind of stuff. Well, I want to see the decision card for the thief on the cross. Amen. Where was his decision card? You know, sometimes we can get so hung up on a method, we miss the whole point of what we're here to do anyway. Amen. I want to see Paul's decision card. Give me a break. 
and the whole thing about the follow-up, we've had so much problems with the follow-up, trying to get the people to follow up the souls we do give them. And in actual fact, sometimes you pray they don't follow them up. The last thing you want them to do is go to that person's church. <laughs> Become as dead as what they are. Amen. I'm not trying to be mean, but come on. Why would you get somebody saved out of life of drugs and alcohol and crime and then and get them out of bondage and go put them right into religious bondage? They sit in church. <laughs> Some more bondage, some more bondage. I used to snort cocaine, now I snort religion. <laughs> Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. At least with cocaine, they had some kind of a buzz. <laughs> I don't know, but they tell me that, but at least they had some kind of a buzz. They didn't even have a buzz with religion. People leave church worse than what they came. When you leave church Sunday more depressed than what you came, why would you go? And if you're a preacher and you preach and you leave church depressed, <laughs> You should make a decision. Oh, gee, do I want this punishment every Sunday? My God, there's got to be something a little bit better than this. Amen. Go into the city. What was the last thing the Lord told you to do? That you have not done. And if he told you to do it and you're doing it, then just stay with that until he gives you the next step. Don't budge. Don't do anything else. Come hell or high water, sink or swim. Come storm, hurricane. Don't do anything other than what he tells you to do. Somebody said, but he told me to do this and I'm in a storm. Hey, you're going to be in a lot of storms when he tells you to do something. But just remember, he's in the boat with you. Just like he said to the disciples, let's go to the other side. And, and they got in the boat. Then the storm rose, he's sleeping. Why was he sleeping? Because he knew they were going to the other side. Someone said, well, if Jesus is in your boat, you'll never have a storm. Oh, yeah, if Jesus is in your boat, you probably going to have some storms. <laughs> but, but just remember this, he, he's going to stand and say, peace be still. You will have storms. These people say there won't be any storm, everything will just be fine. They're talking rubbish. These people say, yeah, come serve God, you'll never have another problem. They don't even know what they're talking about. The Bible says many of the afflictions are righteous, but the Lord delivers us out of them. Oh. So there will be some afflictions that you'll have to be delivered out of. There'll be some lion's den that, that you're going to have to be delivered out of. There's going to be some fiery furnaces. And there might even be some dungeons. I mean, the truth of the matter is that some people actually might be martyrs. You might pay with your life in the service of the king. Make no mistake about it. We're not talking about some game here. You might give your life on a foreign field. 
your blood might flow on the ground. Killed by radicals. Let me tell you, if that ever happened to me, I don't want any one of you to even shed one tear. If you did, shame on you. I just collected something else, another crown. Somebody said, aren't you afraid? What, for what? I'd go to heaven? How bad can that be? Like, I'm going to walk around heaven saying, I shouldn't be here, you know. I'll tell you what. I was, having a, I was having me a crusade down there, and, and I just shouldn't be here. This is not right. Moan, moan, grumble, gripe, gripe. You know, when you get a vision of eternity and it becomes real to you, then the things of the earth are just temporal. You just realize that. Your hair is temporal, your physique is temporal, your teeth are temporal. That photograph of you 20 years ago is temporal. Always amuses me, these preachers advertise them coming to town. It's like a photograph of them 20 years ago, you know. And you get the, the um, anyway, Jesus. <laughs> Say, so, yeah, you send a picture of your son. <laughs> now, the Bible goes on to say here that when he said, Arise, go in the city, shall be told, he said, And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. There are times that men that will be with you, they won't hear that voice. I mean, they'll sense anointing of God. Let me give you an example. I was sitting in a restaurant, I believe it was in Kingsport, Tennessee. We were conducting a series of meetings there and the phone rang and a friend of mine said to me, would you go to Cairo, Egypt? And the moment he said that, I started weeping uncontrollably. Now, everybody sitting around the table, it could have been a phone call, somebody died, somebody you know, tragedy, why is he crying? But you know what? As I was weeping, the power of God f flooded the table. The whole table didn't know what I was weeping about, but the presence of God flooded the table. Come here, sweetie. You're such a distraction to me. Sneak in. How can you sneak in? Come give me a hug. Twenty-four years. Last week, twenty-four years we were married. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. You can get rid of that. We had a great time, just the two of us went on for 10 days. Let's just say this, husband and wife, take, get rid of the kids, not permanently, but <laughs> get, just the two of you go away for 10 days and just be together, nobody else, just the two of you. And just talk and talk and, and see what happens. It'll be good. And don't do it every five years. Do, do it. Do it. As often as you can. <laughs> now, you might only be able to do it, take a day, but take a day and go do it. Anyway, this is for somebody here today. Now, not everybody will hear the voice. But when you begin to share, like they didn't know what the phone call was. You see, you thought I forgot where I was when I was teaching. But no, I know exactly where I was. 
They didn't hear the phone call, come to Egypt, will you come to Egypt? But they felt the presence of God. And when I said, we go to Egypt, it was a total witness. And that's how, when you begin to share the will of God, people will immediately grab the vision because you're speaking God's purpose, you're speaking His plan. And you know, you, you might be in a place where you don't really know what, what the Lord wants you to do next. And they come and ask, well, what are you going to do? And suddenly, you, it, you have the answer and you say, we're going to do this. And they look at you, you look at them. And it's like, this. That's, that's the answer. That's the solution. And I would say this will work for business as well as ministry. It'll work the same in the business realm. God will show you. I'm learning a lot about that in half the last three years. But God will show you. I don't waste any time now. I sit around with businessmen. I just flat rebuke them. I, I rebuke him. I said, look, don't come waste my time nor my money. We funded the end time harvest. Either you for the harvest of souls or you're not. If you're not for souls, get out of here. Somebody said, you mean you do that? Oh, yeah, you better believe that. They come around you. They're not, they're not for you. They're not for the harvest. They're not for eternity. They're not for souls. I don't have time. Can you say amen? It's not a game. We're about the business of the king. Come lie to me. And you know what I do with them now? I make them come to the meetings. You want to do business with me, you come sit in the meetings. Yeah. Well, we busy. Oh, you're too busy to do business with me. Come sit in the meeting, put them on the front row. The fire God fall, watch them. I watch them squirm. I watch them move all over the building. Then I see them skip a meeting or two. Then we get in the business meeting. I say, where were you the last three services? Well, I was just, I said, you know what? I think the deal's through, it's over. We have nothing to talk about. You get on my page to do business with me. I'm not doing business with Judas Iscariot and the seven sons of Sceva and Simon the sorcerer. If there's any businessmen here and you want to check out the people you're going to do business with, Fly them into one of our crusades and come, tell, tell me what you're going to do and, and just come sit with them on the front row. We'll reserve a seat for you and let's put them through the test. If they can sit through three or four meetings and, and their hearts up, and then, then you might be getting down to whether you can do business with those people. Amen? Somebody said, you crazy. Well, I ain't crazy. Not everybody's going to hear the voice of God when the Lord speaks to you. But when you communicate it again, the same way with the intensity it came to you, it'll be communicated through you. And then people will get behind the vision of what the Lord said to do. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Sometimes, and I'll tell you why there's been such a problem. I'm, I'm on the subject now. I might as well address this. Sometimes there's been a problem with business in the, in the church world because people can hang around the church, carry a Bible, and rip everybody off. You know, carry a Bible, walk around, rip everybody off. And nobody's going to do anything because they all forgive. You know, we love you, forgive you, sorry. Some people just need to have their butt thrown in jail. Amen. Just throw them in jail. 
If they repent, release them. If they don't repent, throw them in jail. Because then they're going to go around and rip the next group of the body of Christ off and the next group of the body of Christ off. Amen? Seeing I'm on the subject, I get really irritated. People always come around trying to make money off the believers. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Oh, Pastor, we got this great business plan. Yeah, it's to put money in your pocket. That's right. When, you know how you know it's God? When they say, we, we want to put money in the ministry. We want, to, we want to see how we can get involved in the ministry. We've got this great plan. And you know what? It really entails taking the money from the wicked and putting it in the hands of the just. No, go, go looking to take money from the just and put it in the hands of the just. The wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. Amen. Everything we do within the church should be to bless one another. Everything we do within the church should be to prosper one another and to bless one another and to help one another. Amen. I want to prosper you. I want to get you prosperous. I want to get you blessed. But I can't do all the work for you. That's another thing. Some people don't even want to go into the city. They're too lazy to go into the city. Your miracle's waiting for you in your obedience to do what God tells you to do. That's where your miracle is. That's where your breakthrough is. I've got everybody and their dog, you know, they wanted to go to Lakeland to get in there. Do you know how I went to Lakeland? How many want to know how I ended up in Lakeland, Florida? I flew across country, my own money, put myself in a hotel to go on a 10 minute talk show that aired in Alaska. And a lady saw me on that show and invited me to Juneau, Alaska. When she invited me, I called up. She said, I want you to come to Juneau, Alaska. I said, well, do you have a church? No. I said, well, do you know church? Well, I do know church. I said, do you know the pastor? I kind of know him. I thought, oh God, this is just great. So she talks to him. Anyway, we get on the phone. He says, he said, come on up. We go up to Juno. And Juno, what happened? <laughs> the Sunday night, the woman came out of a wheelchair. And the revival hit that whole town of 30,000 people. We probably had over close to 4,000 people come through the doors over the next three weeks. And there wasn't a place you could go from the shopping mall to the airport to anywhere people were talking about the revival. And they were talking about Dolly Phillips because everybody knew her condition, crippling arthritis in a wheelchair, walking around healed by the power of God. Then he told me, he said that he had some friends who had a church in Fargo, North Dakota. Would you go? Yeah, so I get on the phone, talk to the pastor, likely to come to Fargo. I said, well, it depends on how far I can go. <laughs> so we went down to Fargo, had a meeting there. While I'm in the meeting, a pastor comes to me and he says, I'm a chaplain down at the penitentiary down here. Would you come? I said, well, we're in two meetings a day. He said, I know. Could you come speak to the, to the men's president and speak to the woman's president? I said, boy, <laughs> it's not hardly any time to breathe, but anyway, I'll come. So I went over, spoke to the men's president, went and spoke to the woman in prison, did the two prisons. And right after the thing, he said, I have a brother in Michigan. And he has a church. Would you go there? So I said, yeah. I said, well, how many can they see? He said, oh, about four or five hundred. Well, I thought he had four or five hundred. He didn't. 
He had like 30 people. I didn't know that, you know, I didn't, I didn't care. I never, you know, I didn't have to have a requirement. This is 1992. I didn't have to have a requirement of how many people were there before I went. I just wanted to know how many we could fit in the building. Didn't matter what we started with, we weren't gonna finish with that. And so we end up in Michigan. Well, what's the name of that place now? Mount Pleasant. Do you remember that? Now, I had just come out of a trip from Africa. I had just finished up that Sunday, 4,000 people standing remotely in the church. Fly straight out, I'm going to Michigan for the next crusade. I arrive, I walk in Sunday morning. Some old dame on the pen, oh my God, the thing was out of tune. I mean, about as much anointing as you could ever, ever begin to imagine. And I'll tell you to say the least, I was inspired. I mean, <laughs> Jesus. And there's 30 people sitting there. It looked like that it was a museum where they had been preserved yeah. with embalming fluid and, and didn't, that, they were, that we'd come upon some fossils that, that, no, I'm serious. I mean, there was no life, no joy, no nothing. I mean, nothing. It wasn't even response. No amen, no hallelujah, no raise your hand, no clap, no, no I mean, just nothing, just like. And I'm going, Lord. What did I do? <laughs> Have I sinned? Who has, who has sinned, this man or his parents? You know, <laughs> Lord, what, 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 what did I do? We, last week, 4,000 people stared about power of God falling into place, revival, the altars packed. Yeah, 30 people. They people, are they people, Lord? So I never quit. I knew I am not a quitter. Listen, let me tell you right now. I, I lock in and I, I said, okay, fine. I said, well, at least we have a building. I always look at the positive side. At least we've got a building set up to 500 people. My God, we've got a building. Praise God, we've got a building. That's better than a poke in the eye with a blunt stick. And we started smacking it. I mean, there were some days we started the meeting at 10. And I, at that time, I was doing the worship. I was leading on the keyboard. I was doing all the worship. I did everything. I was doing the worship. From 10 to 12, by 12 o'clock, I'm over. Because, you know, you worship and you weren't getting anywhere with that. So then you teach a little bit on giving. That didn't help. You know, you, you, sang, you sang with a guitar. That didn't help. And then you... You try to preach, not much of that helped. At least you didn't think so to begin with. And then you laid hands on everything three times, you know. <laughs> and then 12 o'clock, the meeting's over. I mean, there's no more, there's nothing else to do. You've done it all, you're like wiped out. Well, I went in that time and I sat down on my computer and I began to write that book, The Touch of God. I spent 186 hours over the next three, four weeks writing the book. I didn't know that that was my last real free time I would ever have. Because at the end of three weeks, that place was packed. Hundreds and hundreds of people jammed that place. I didn't know where we were going when we finished. I knew we should finish. And I always finish on a high, always finish when the place is jammed. Never run the thing into the ground. Always finish on a high. Finish meetings with the building packed, 3,000 people, 1,500 in overflow. That's the time to leave. Amen. That's a revival. Not running 27 weeks with 78 people. That's not revival. That's an excuse for a place to preach and rob people of an offering. Amen. Oh, we having revival. What's happening? Well, not many people coming. You ain't having revival. You're just having a meeting. Why don't you just take a gun and hold them up and empty their wallets? Anyway. 
sorry for being blunt. <laughs> sorry for being sharp. But anyway, so, uh, so I'm walking up the aisle, and, and a pastor walks up and walks me and says, I want you to come to my church. He said, when can you come to my church? I said, Sunday morning we'll be there. He said, what? I said, yeah, Sunday morning we'll be there. I actually was walking up here thinking to myself, Lord, I need another church to go to. I don't know where I'm going. And I, he handed me his card. He said, you mean we're starting this Friday night? He said, we start on Sunday morning? I said, yes. He said, I don't have time to advertise. I said, we don't need time to advertise. Not after what I just saw here, this thing. My God, even if we had advertised, they might have got a few more corpses in there. <laughs> and you know, and what's so beautiful about the Friday night, the place is packed. And it's such a difference. You can't even believe that these were the same people that you started out with three weeks ago. Their faces are shining. Their eyes are sparkling. So he said, okay, well, I've never done this before. I said, hey, we're going to do a lot of things we've never done before. We go straight up to Gaylord, Michigan. You know where that is, moving up closer. We came up there, we drove, took one Saturday, went up to Mackinac Island, and I got a beautiful picture of the Mackinac Bridge with the sun setting. It's in my mom and dad's home, and they blew it up and it's framed. So I've been up in your parts, <laughs> in the Upper Peninsula. I haven't been back, but I've been up in the parts. <laughs> 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 Bless your heart. But you, 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 I'm telling you, the fire of God's going to hit your whole region. Yes. Amen. When you get home, it's going to hit your whole region. So anyway, so we go here to this church. Within two weeks, that was packed. So I said, well, what are we going to do? So they got a, I believe it was 700 seat of tent, put it outside. This is the month of, of August of 92. We move into the tent, 10 packs out. So when um, we come to the place, the tent is full, I said, I think it's time to end the meeting. <laughs> yeah, I so said, we reached capacity. We don't have anywhere else to go. I'm not staying here until, you know, it's time to finish it now. We've had a good time. Four weeks, you know, that's a good time. So he said, I have a, a brother in Stewart, Florida. Would you go there? I said, sure. I called him up. He said, when would you go? I said, Sunday. <laughs> we'll start Sunday. He said, well, you don't have time to advertise. I said, we don't need time to advertise. You saw what God did here. He calls his brother up. He says, um, he said, would you have him come? He said, well, you know, we've been here. And they went in the church, packed that out, went in the tent, packed that out. He said, he said sure, come on down. We get down there. I flew, I flew in. On, 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 the Saturday, on the Saturday. Now listen to this. Guess who's showing up on, on the weekend? Hurricane Andrew is showing up on the weekend. Now I don't even know the pastor. He's saying to me, he said, well, we can't even have the survival. I said, listen, let me tell you right now. I didn't close out a meeting up in Michigan to come down here and not have a meeting. We, I never seen a hurricane. I didn't even know what a hurricane looked like. I said, we having a meeting. I mean, we bless God having a meeting. Now, I know a little different now because I live in Florida <laughs> and be, been through a couple of things. But back then, you've got to understand, we don't have hurricanes in South Africa. I was just adamant, bless God, we having a hurricane. I don't care what happens. I mean, we having a meeting. Amen. And uh, we had to evacuate. We ended up evacuating twice where we were staying. And uh, but we did start the meeting on the Sunday. Hurricane came through 90 miles south, devastated Homestead, Florida. And, and I, just, I just cranked it. I didn't know anything about hurricanes at all and we were and you know when when it came over we we just got a little breeze was overcast trees doing that but nothing major and really could have hit us but that weekend the hurricane hit started that revival and within two weeks we packed that place then we got a thousand seat tent stuck it out in the parking lot and packed that and when we packed that I when when that was filled I said ah, it's time to go now 
Well, I was sitting watching television and I'm watching Carl Strader on with somebody else and he's talking about the survival that's just happened in the East Coast and they outgrew the church for intended. And he said, I'd love that to happen. Yeah, I thought, my God, this, he's talking about our meeting. He's talking about our meeting. I said, the pastor, he's talking about the meeting we just had. He'd love to have that. Where's that guy? He said, he's up in Lincoln. I said, well, call him. Tell him we'd love to come there. So in December, I went over to Orlando. I got to speak for Pastor Benny when he still had the church. I spoke for him. And then I went over to meet with Pastor Carl Strader. We, and Pastor, said to me, Pastor Strader said to me, he said, he said, we're about to close our doors. He said, the church is in that condition. He said, he said we need you to come desperately. I said, now, so I'm telling you right now, I said, there's some things. I'm going to plow the field across the grain because we don't, you know, I don't go in there and pet people's doctrine. I go in there and give the word. Yeah. If you want me, then you want my message. If you don't want my message, don't have me come because I ain't changing my message to anybody. I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm not trying to be mean. But signs and wonders follow the preacher and the word. They don't follow your opinion. So he said, look, it doesn't matter. We're about to close the doors. Anyway, you might as well come. So I went in there. Forget about what we had on Sunday. That means nothing. Because Sunday, you always get the people show up who show up every Sunday, no matter what. You can have Elijah there, Elisha, Jesus, Moses. It doesn't matter. They show up Sunday morning. <laughs> Monday morning, we had 500 people in their building. Monday night, 1,500. We're live on the radio. By the end of the first week, we had 5,000. The end of the second week, 6,000. In the third week, 7,000. In the fourth week, 8,000 people. On an off night, 4,000 people show up. We'd actually leave the meeting and say, ah, oh, it was a bad night. The crowd was down tonight. And we spent four weeks. I left for two weeks, came back for another two weeks, left for two weeks, came back. A total over a period of a year of about 13 weeks. And really, they wanted me to carry on going and keep it going. And, and the Lord said, no, if you do that, within two years, you'll be finished, they'll be finished because people start worshiping the church as though something special is here and they'll worship Lakeland and they'll think there's a portal open. God said, I want to do this in every city in America and there's no place that I respect. You know, God just looks for hungry people. He doesn't, God doesn't favor a city over another city and, and he blesses that city and then everybody makes out like it's a sovereign move of God. What a bunch of rubbish. God sovereignly moved 2,000 years ago. You either plug into the sovereign move of God or you don't plug in. Because, because, you know, then they say, well, how did revival come? Well, we had a sovereign move of God. Okay, so then what does that say for me then? What about me? I didn't have one. So God sovereignly chose to move with you. No, the Bible says if you hunger, here's the sovereign move of God. If you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you will be full. If you draw nigh to me, I'm drawn nigh to you. What does that tell me? Those are the ingredients that causes God to move. Regardless of every, any city, every, any town, every village, we, we have proven it over the years that we can have revival anywhere, any place, any time. Now, it might get a little heated, and we might have a couple of stonings, and there might be a lynch mob sent out for us, and we, it might get a lot hot before it gets easy. Because I might have to get down, I might have to get dirty. I might have to use some dynamite and a bulldozer or two running through the front of the shop. But you know what? We just plow. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, break for Saturday, start again Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, two meetings a day, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, stop, rest Saturday, it's Monday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and, and by the third week, boy, now, you, now it's starting to cook now. Now it's starting to cook. And then that fourth week, it's like a bomb goes off. And by Friday night, they jammed in the, I mean, in all heavens breaking loose. But to get to that place, you thought you were dying. You literally, you thought, I'm dying. I'm going to get killed. They're going to kill me. They're going to lynch me. They're going to run me out of town. And then I learned right at that place when, when everything was just exploding, that's the time to, okay, it's time to go now. But that's how we ended up in Lakeland. We ended up in Lakeland because we went to Juneau. 
Because we went to Juneau, we went to Fargo. Because we went to Fargo, we went to Mount Pleasant, Michigan. Because we went to Mount Pleasant, Michigan, we ended up in Gaylord, Michigan. Because we went to Gaylord, Michigan, we ended up in Stewart, Florida. Because we went to Stewart, Florida, we ended up in Lake. Oh, I didn't include when we were in Fargo, we went to the prison. The prison was the key. Because that's the guy who had the brother in Michigan. So sometimes in the insignificant meeting that you did, that wasn't your main meeting while you were there, the insignificant little sideline thing that you did that you really, it was really inconvenient for you to do, it really was, boy, this is beyond the call of duty now. Therein, go into the city and it'll be told you, therein lies the key to the next level. If I hadn't gone to the prison, I wouldn't have met that guy. He would never said go to Mount Pleasant. I'd never gone to Mount Pleasant, never ended up in, 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 in Gaylord, and never ended up in Stewart. And then it would never have ended up in Lakeland. Maybe God would have, maybe three years later, ended up bringing me to Lakeland. I don't know. But I'll just tell you right now, a step of obedience in the direction of what God's telling you to do. And it doesn't have to be the Lord's telling me what to do for the next 18, 24, 36 months. It can be what God's telling me to do next week. And I'm going to do all my might. I'm going to do it. I don't care if I don't know what I'm doing the week after that. I don't care if other people come to tell me I don't, you don't know what you're doing. And I'll tell them I don't. But when I do, you'll know about it. Hallelujah. Be, be sensitive to the Lord. If, 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 if there's something coming up ahead and the Lord doesn't want you to do it, cancel it. Be sensitive to change. We were scheduled to go to St. Louis five, six weeks ago. And I wasn't happy with the way the meetings were coming together. I just didn't like it. I mean, I'm spending my money to go in there, rent the auditorium, do the crusade. I want them to run the way that I feel the Lord's telling me to do it. I'm not going to spend my money and then be told about how the meeting is going to happen. Amen? Amen. So I just pulled the plug. So I said, Lord, and I heard one word, London. London? Yeah, London, England. London? That's, that's three weeks away. London. And then the name of a pastor jumped out at me. I called him. He was in Cyprus on vacation. I said, hey, pastor. He said, yeah. I said, remember you called me two years ago, wanted me to come to London? I said, I'm coming. He said, great. When? I said, three weeks from now. He said, what? He said, we don't have time to advertise. <laughs> and we went in there. I'm telling you right now, the power of God hit that place. By Friday night, it was, ex it was explosive. God TV came in, taped everything, and it's being aired all, all over Europe. You know, we were just in a local church. I believe by the last night, I had about 800 people there. Let me tell you right now, there were people from Wales, there were people from Scotland, there were people from Ireland, there were people from towns, cities, and villages all, all around. The fire of God hit, hit the youth, and then there's stuff that opened up through that that is, is major, major things open up because of that. Amen. So I want to encourage you this morning, I'm going to wrap this up with this, but when the Lord called Saul, he said, what do you want me to do? Because we all say, what do you want me to do? He says, go in the city. He'll always tell you to do something, and then the rest of the direction will come as you go. Go into the city, and it will be told you what you must do. If you're not hearing from God and you're not hearing what the Lord's wanting to do, go back to the last thing he told you to do. Amen. I was trying to think of it a little earlier and got distracted there. But remember when you walk in through the, through the house and you want to go tell your wife something and you get in the room and you forget what you want to tell them, you know, and then you walk back to where you were when you remembered to tell her, you know, you, you're like, you backtrack, okay, let me go stand there and see if I, oh yeah, yeah. And then you go back and, and tell. It's the same way. Go back to the last thing the Lord told you to do and then make sure that you've done it. If you haven't repent, make sure you've done it and then do it 
and then the rest that will unfold. The rest will come. The rest of the word will come. The rest of the vision will come. The rest of the direction will come. The rest of the plan will come. The rest of the purpose will come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's not going to tell you everything. You're not going to know everything. You'll only know in part, and prophesy in part. Always remember that. We know in part, we prophesy in part, and we see through a glass darkly. And these people, they, they say they, they carry on like they know everything that's going on. You don't, you lying dog, you, you don't know everything. You only know portions. You only know pieces. And the other won't become apparent until you get there and the rest comes into view. I mean, I see you here, I see somebody behind you, but I can't see everything about them. But when I get to you, then I can look beyond you and I see more in detail. Amen? It's the same with the purpose and the plan of God. I have a vision of what I see happening. I don't know how to get there. But I do know this. Every day. When the storm comes, just keep going. Keep walking. What am I doing? Doing what he told me to do last. Just keep doing what he told me to do. Just keep doing. Just keep doing. Just keep doing what he told me to do. Amen. Is this helping anybody here today? Don't worry about the future, please. Don't worry about tomorrow. Faith for today. Strength for today. Joy for today. Victory for today. Peace for today. Provision for today. Obedience for today. And when tomorrow comes, we'll start it all over again. on a journey to see whole nation shaken and you know where that started it started with New York and there was Shreveport it became a little bit more clearer and Soweto's becoming even more clearer and then Umlazi it's becoming much and much more plain God will show us exactly everything that's needed to take cities and nations and what we apply in third world countries, we'll apply in first world nations as well. Because all it takes in a first world nation is a little bit more money. But the Lord will empower us by his grace to have the necessary wherewithal, unlimited funds. No, I'm not, please, I'm not talking about an offering now. I'm talking about businesses. I'm talking about corporations that all they'll do is fund the harvest. The Lord spoke to me just like he said, raise up a hundred evangelists, fiery flaming evangelists to carry the fire. I'm going to raise up a hundred companies to fund the harvest. Glory to God. Yeah, yeah, come on. Because we need the both. Two have to work together. So we're going to raise up 100 companies to fund the end-time harvest. Thank you, Lord Jesus. It might never be 200 companies when all said and done. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Dealing in the wealth of nations, whatever nation we target, we go in there, we do business. We strip the Egyptians of their wealth and we fund the harvest within that nation with the natural resources and what they have within their country. Amen. Yes. Praise God. I can't tell you too much more than that, but that's all I'm going to say about that right now. I've already said too much. 
but it's the future is another realm that the church has never been in. Amen. And they won't, they won't be able to stop you because you go right in and you just shut the TV down, shut the radio down, the billboards, the subways, the buses. When you have, you know, we're going to go back to New York. Did you know that? We're going to go back to Madison Square Garden. Somebody said, when? I think 2009 will be a good year. I feel, I've been stirring, feeling stirring my spirit that 10 years after Madison Square Garden, we'll, we'll go back. We'll pay cash for that one. Oh, yeah, we'll be back in the garden. That's if they haven't broken it down. I think they want to build another one. They haven't even paid for that one. They want to build another one. But whatever's there, we'll go back. We're going to see New York shaking. I know what the Lord told me. I know what I felt in 99. It's not over. There'll be another good news in New York. Amen. Hallelujah. And we won't have a limited budget of $6.3 million. We'll go in and drop $200 million and shake the city. Oh, yeah. No, it's coming. You know what? It's just another time, ladies and gentlemen. It's just another time. You better get ready. You better hold on to your horses. San Jose watching, Madison, Ohio watching, Sacramento, California, Mercedes, Texas, Munich, Germany watching. Feel the anointing coming through. Sacramento is trying, searching for flights to try to make it here by Friday. People are hungry, people are desperate. If I could fill this room every session with hungry people from around the station, my God. You know, and that's all it is, it's just hungry people. I got some things the Lord's been speaking to me about nations. As we tell, you know what we're gonna do? Maybe I shouldn't tell anybody right now. Uh, I must keep quiet about it. We'll just do it. People see it happen. My wife spoke to me. She said, you tell too much. So I'm listening to my wife. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, we love you. I hope you sense that. We want God's best for you and his plan for your life and your ministry. Amen. Best is yet to come. And the world's going to get worse. The world's going to be a nightmare. Hurricanes, tornadoes, you don't even have to be a prophet. Flood waters rising, global warming, new plagues, pestilence, famine, sword, wars, rumors of wars, woman presidents, all this stuff's going to happen. <laughs> and you don't even have to be a prophet about it. Catastrophes, calamities, the likes of which has never been seen on the planet. But for the, I'm not focusing on that. I can't focus on that. Our focus is on eternal things in the kingdom and the souls and the harvest. And for that purpose, the Holy Ghost empowers us to, to do what the Lord has called us to do. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Whew. Well, let's, uh, let's give you an opportunity to sow some seed this morning. Amen. Amen. Praise God. As, I, as we told you last night, be in prayer. We uh, move some mountains here. This week we've got to move some mountains. Amen. Those of you that are here for the first time, so generously today. Amen. If you didn't come prepared, go this afternoon and lose something. Bring it tonight. Be a part with us in this great harvest. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your people today as they sow seed. Lord, you know exactly what we 
what we need and what they need and the harvest. And thank you, Lord, you're moving us to a place of supernatural provision. We have one of these crusades can be paid up front. And there'll be no lack, no hindrance. And we'll still trust you even in those times. We promise you we'll trust you in those times. And I pray that you bless the gift and the giver. And Lord, whatever's needed for their ministries, I pray that you would release that as well and take care of every single one in this place. For those watching my way of television, Lord, you know what they have need of. I pray that you'd meet that need. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Praise God. Make your checks out of RMI. If you're giving by way of credit card, you can. MasterCard, Visa, American Distress, and you'll discover several other ways to give. I says if you hand out the offering envelopes, Online, right now, you can give by way of secure online giving. If you've been blessed watching online, which I know you have, many said the anointing of God has come right through the screen. Please just give right now, sow a seed, do something. Or you can send a love gift to RMI River Television, P.O. Box 292888, Tampa, Florida, 33687. That is P.O. Box 292888, Tampa, Florida, 33687. For your love gift this month of $100 or more, we'll send you a shower cap with the hand of blessing, a piece of the old rugged cross, water from the Jordan, or oil from the Holy Land, or a life size poster me to put in the refrigerator. I'm kidding you. A shower cap with a hand of blessing on it, yeah. So when you shower, you got this hand of blessing on it. Oh, do you for real? Yeah. Chinese chopsticks, prayer shawls. Our very own signature signed shofar. Amen. Flag of the month. We'll send you a little vial of gold dust from our last meeting. Anyway. We'll send you a very own little feather that appeared in one of our services. <laughs> oh, brother. You know, the feather had nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. It's just a flock of Canadian geese heading south and Feather got dislodged, come through the air conditioning duct. Fly down, land on somebody in the service. My God, Holy Spirit's here. When they're taken, get a test in the laboratory, some, some goose of some kind. Well, you really have to be desperate for the supernatural when you're looking for a feather. You must be really hard up. I had an email from one place. Jesus appeared at a light bulb. So, somebody in the building found a light bulb which looked like the figure of Jesus in the light bulb. <laughs> they had pictures of it and everything. People going by looking at the light bulb. Pentecostal, charismatic church. That's no different from that building in Clearwater where the Virgin Mary appeared. It's idolatry. It's idolatry. Tear down them idols, amen. Yep. Stay with the anointing, right. the presence of God. So much easier. Put some people out of the ministry, but it's so much easier. Amen. Oh. <laughs> My brother went to preach in some church up in Oregon with the speakers. The, the, the speakers were glowing red. People come around, they see, you see the red tinge on the speakers. So we have in revivalist move of God, this red glow on the speakers. 
So Basil called him in the back room. He said, you people are sick. <laughs> You're sick. You need to repent before God. This is not God. So people get saved and charismatic and lose their brains. <laughs> Have no brain, will travel. We were in that one place in Carolinas, and the whole floor was was glitter, glittering. And people come in. You see that? You see that? The pastor's wife said to me, we made banners here last week. <laughs> they made banners with glitter. There was glitter. Did you see that? <laughs> Did you see that? <laughs> huh? <laughs> no wonder the world's not being reached. You know, I'm interested in... I'm not interested in how many feathers you saw, oil appeared on the wall, Jesus in a light bulb, speakers growing red, red glitter on the floor. How many got saved? How many got healed? Who, who's going to foreign field? Who's going to missions? How many souls are getting saved? How many people reach? What are you doing? Come here, I'll slap you a shot. Come here. Somebody needs to help you a little bit. Amen. I said, the only time I'm interested in them gold that come in the, in the place is if we can get together and melt it and sell it and pay for the crusades. I'm into it then, boy. Yeah. Hey, we have our own little refinery going. I'm into that. Until then, I've got no time for that. Amen. Amen. All right, if anybody still wants to give, us just go ahead and <laughs> receive whatever's left. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hamboristakaya. Wasn't that an awesome time of worship this morning? Praise God. How many got something from the Lord today? Chupacabra is alive in the state of Florida. <laughs> How many know what a chupacabra is? It's a fictitious animal that roams Puerto Rico that sucks the life out of animals and goats and cows. And, huh? That sucks the blood, yeah. It's a, it's a Puerto Rican myth. But I think they said the Americans sent the chupacabra there. Isn't that right? Yeah, it's the American that sent the chupacabra there. But I, and I was there. When I came back home, I recognized a few here in America. I thought, <laughs> my God, them religious chupacabras come into the ch church and suck the blood out of people. And they sit there bloodless. <laughs> yeah, they believe there's chupacabra in Me Mexico as well. Yeah, they did. And we'll deal with that next week. No, it's, it's kind of a, a Central and South America, Puerto Rican thing. They had, they had kids. <laughs> Chupacabras multiplied and replenished the Spanish world, but we'll deal with that next week.
If you see somebody sitting in a service, long face, sad, depressed, it's a possibility that Chupacabra got them. <laughs> if you look, look closely, you see little the holes where, where the blood's been taken out. Praise God. Everybody stand if you would, please. <laughs> Just lift your hands. In closing, say this. Jesus said a lot of things. But one of the things he said was my sheep know my voice the voice of a stranger, the voice of the stranger. They, will not follow. they will not follow. I'm one of his sheep. I, of his sheep. I, obey, his I obey his voice. And I'll do, and I'll do what he tells me to do. And I purpose in my heart today to look at my life and to go back to the last thing he told me to make sure I'm doing it. And I'll be faithful to continue doing it until he tells me different. Go into the city, and then it will be told me. Father, I thank you that I receive your perfect will for my life. I'll not choose based on money. I'll not choose based on comfort. I'll not choose based on circumstance but I choose based on your purpose and your plan. I thank you for it now. I receive it by faith. By faith coming out of this conference. I have your will. I have your word. I'm one of your sheep. I know your voice. Thank you for speaking to me. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to me. And Lord, speak to me in any way you wish. In the night hours, in dreams, in visions, revelations, your inward promptings, the still small voice, audible voice. Lord, through your word, through other people that you sent to me that come with the anointing and the word of the Lord, I open my heart. Holy Spirit, you're directing me. You're leading me. I will have the will of God. I'm confident of this one thing, that he who began a good work in me is able to complete it. And I shall be completed when it's all said and done. And for that, I lift my hands and thank you for it now. Hallelujah. 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 Just can I say one other thing quickly? You know, we, we of this generation that we're living in right now, you, you're feeling something you don't know how to put into words, and partly because it's never been done before. What God, I believe, is going to have this generation is going to do some of the most out-of-the-box stuff. I mean, totally off the charts. Just, there's no reference point. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because the church of the last century, you know, the 50s was breaking free, 60s, and then the charismatic movement, 70s, the, the word of faith teaching, and, all that, and then the 80s, and then the revival flow of the 90s. But... It's mainly, it's mainly a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy with a little added thing. But what God's about to do with the 21st century church is just so far beyond. It's like people say, well, where does it start and where does it finish? It's, it's like the river. There's no boundaries to it. There's no banks to it. It's, it's as wide as God is. And it's as colorful as he is with so many facets that, of, of who he is. And, and, and it's, it's spread beyond the Sunday morning service. It's in the marketplace. It's in the edge. This thing 
that we are about to see happen is so much greater than anything that we've seen before. So don't limit him. Don't put him in a box. Don't say this is the only way he's going to do it. You know, mass crusade is not the only way we're going to win people, but it's one of the ways. But there's a whole bunch of other ways we're going to. Do you know that Billy Graham is actually having more people saved right now than he ever had in the history of his ministry? Somebody said, no, you're crazy. He can't even speak. He's quit preaching. Let me tell you, he is, because they are going into countries, buying secular time on secular TV and airing his meetings, and they're setting up phone banks, and they're reaping hundreds of thousands of souls every week all around the world, and, he, and they're airing some of the older crusades, and he's preaching, and the greatest harvest of Billy Graham's ministry is actually happening now. And nobody would believe that to say, no, he, he can't even preach. Because one thing about their ministry, they've adapted, they've made the decision to adapt, and, 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 and they'll go into a whole country and buy prime time, spend six, seven, eight, nine million for three hour shows on a secular network, and then have all the phone banks there and all the churches and, and people phoning, answering people as they've been prayed for and whatever. And you know what, what, what is technology going to make available to us in the next five years that we don't have right now? Well, the fact of the matter already with the internet, look how many people watch it from different states and nations and whatever, and it's going out on the web. Well, what about in the next little while? It's already happening, but just about everybody will be able to have a broadcast on their cell phone. The, the, the thing's unlimited, and we just must, if you put God in a box, somebody might be touching the world from, from their garage. They build a studio in the garage with a camera and all that, and they'd be speaking the globe. It's unbelievable what's happening. Amen. Thank God for this hour. I'm so happy to be alive in 2005. I'm so happy to be alive. I wouldn't. I wouldn't swap this time with any other time in the history of the planet. I wouldn't have wanted, I would not have wanted to be in Azusa Street. Please, Azusa Street doesn't even touch what's happening now. I wouldn't, want, I wouldn't even wanted to be in the Welsh Revival. Listen, I wouldn't even wanted to be on the day of Pentecost. Someone said, you crazy. No, I ain't crazy. Huh? Oh, man, we get to be a part.